What's going down, everybody? Welcome back to a brand new interview right here on Cassius Morris Official. Before we hop in, just a quick reminder to smash that subscribe button down below if you enjoy the free content I've been putting up every single day. Also, make sure to hit the notification bell next to the button so that you don't miss any updates. Drop a comment down below and, of course, hit that like button to get that algorithm algorithm and get more people seeing this interview. Today on the channel is a pleasure to be joined by rock and roll guitarist and radio host Billy Morrison. Billy Morrison is, of course, known for his work in Billy Idol, having a long career in broadcasting, and of course, being Ozzy Osbourne's right-hand man. Billy Morrison's latest single, Crack Cocaine, featuring Ozzy Osbourne and Steve Stevens, is set to drop on March 21st. Make sure to click the links down below to connect with Billy and access his new music. His new album is dropping on April 19th, and as I told Billy in this conversation, it is a powerful album. I'm really excited for everybody out there to get access to it. And I'm even more excited for you guys to enjoy my conversation with Billy Morrison. Billy Morrison, thank you so much for taking the time to join me right here on Cassius Morris Official. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So listen, right off the bat, I just wanted to let you know, I did get the chance to hear some cuts from the latest record. I went through the whole thing. Um, oh, wow. They sent you the whole album? They did. They did. Oh, fantastic. They, they sent me it. So I, I've had my, you know, a chance to sink my teeth into it. And I will say my first reaction to this was thank God, because honestly, you know, after going through this project, I really feel like rock and roll needs this record. I mean, maybe give us a little bit of insight into the Morrison project and what's been oh, going man. on. That is, that is such a nice way to start this. Um, you know, let me start by saying I didn't know I was making an album. I really didn't. What what I was doing during COVID was just making music because I have a studio. I have a wonderful home studio here. It's very, very nice. And that's what I do. I'm a creative person. So I was throwing hip-hop beats with EDM samples and metal guitars together for no reason. I was just like, oh, this is cool for no reason. And I believed that the end result of this album is so good because I wasn't writing a record. I wasn't thinking I need a single. Uh, how am I going to get this signed? Who's going to sit? I wasn't thinking any of that. I ended up with like, you know, 20 instrumental tracks of random genres. And it was only when Sharon Osbourne said to me, you know, this one song that you've got with Ozzy, we think you sh that should be a single. And I said, what, what do you mean? You should release it. Billy Morrison featuring Ozzy and Steve Stevens. Do a video. We'll help you do the press. And at that point, I was like, well, there's no point in just putting out one song. And I have all this music. And I think I sent Corey Taylor the track and went, because he's a close friend. Hey, buddy, do you want to sing on this for me? And I had no idea it was going to be a record the organic nature of what how that album came together is why it feels so necessary because it was done out of the love of multiple genres not yeah. to make a record so you really felt a freedom in that because i mean a lot of people you know they'll be looking at what is what is my tiktok strategy what am i going to do for first week numbers you're Huge. just calling your friends and making music a hundred percent and even down to the, the very last guest recorded was billy idol and even at, at that point, it hadn't dawned on me just how big the project had become. Right. Because I was still taking music and going, well, Idol will sound great on this, you know. Or like when I did the Al Jurgensen track, the record wasn't a record. It was just, I have a track and it's perfect for you. And then... And the way it happened organically, you know, when Al was doing his vocals, he said, you know what, who would be good on this is John Five. John's in my text. So I text John. John's like, I love ministry. I love you. Let's do it. And it was just an organic thing. There was zero pressure on me until the end. Okay. So what was the pressure at the end exactly? Is it like this, this period now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Talking to guys like me. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, look, when when I arrived at the finished body of work and I drove in my car around L.A. and I played it from track one to track 12, I realized I had something really strong. Yeah. 
And when you have that, you don't just want to stick it out. So that's when I started, <coughs> you know, I Sharon is helping. Sharon's power is huge in this business. Um, the label, Dennis at the label, is, is huge behind it. Um, and I started taking it seriously. So I'm like, okay, let's do press. Let's do videos. Yeah. And so that's when the pressure mounts. So speaking on the single crack cocaine, of course, with Ozzy and Steve Stevens. So you were mentioning that this was recorded before the idea for this record. So what were the circumstances for this track? Well, so obviously Ozzy and I are best friends um, for nearly 30 years now. But the reason we're best friends is we try and keep the music part separate. We we talk about Cadbury's chocolate and the Sex Pistols and the weather and stuff that friends talk about. But clearly, we're both musicians, and over the years we've known each other, we've made music. We've written songs occasionally. One of those songs came out on the God Shaped Hole album. And so this song was done, Crack Cocaine was done, Steve and I – wanted to write the ultimate Aussie riff just because Steve Stevens and I have been in a band for 15 years together. So we do make music together. And Steve lived in LA at the time. Aussie's my best mate. So I call Aussie. I'm like, listen, we got a riff. Come over to Steve's. So he comes over to Steve's and it's just three friends hanging out in Steve's studio and we finished the song. It was so good. We finished it, but then it goes on the shelf because Ozzy's making his own albums with his own producers. But Sharon was the one that brought it back up. She said, look, you know, you, this is an amazing song. You should put it out. So it got resurrected. Wow. Thank God. I mean, that's so cool. I mean, what a room too. you, Ozzy and Steve Stevens. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, how many hours did it only take a couple hours and this track was done? Oh, dude, the lyric was written in about 20 minutes. Wow, Aussie, that's insane. Once Ozzy starts, it's amazing to watch, right? We were in the studio, and me and Steve are recording the guitars, and he's just sitting there like that. He's not saying very much. And he gets a bit of paper, and you see his head go down. It's like that. And then he looks up and he goes, I put you down and pick you up again, like crack cocaine. And me and Steve are like, holy shit, that's a chorus. And then when he gets behind the mic, it's – this is how – the reason he's nominated for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and he should have been in there a long time ago. Real iconic singers, Idol, when Idol sang Mr. Dream, took him about half an hour, a couple of takes, and he's out. And Oz is the same. Once that green light goes on and that he gets behind the mic, makes the hairs on the back of your neck stand up. He's incredible. So Ozzy, Ozzy pretty much was in and out in a couple of hours. And then he leaves me and Steve to put it all together. And, you know, that's how it works. Wow. That is so cool. You know, I, even I'm about to get chills just picturing what you're, what you're describing here. I mean, you know, his presence on the track, too. I mean, you know, he sounds the same as he did on a track 25 years ago. I mean, I, you know, to to watch him sort of, does it almost feel like he transforms in a sense? He does, he gets into transform. The booth, he does. He does yeah. transform. He's been doing it so long, and that's the reason he's an icon. There's a lot of singers, there's a lot of famous singers, but an icon, you know, that's that's what makes an icon is he transforms and he knows what he's doing. And there was also there was also an energy when we recorded Crack Cocaine that was friends. Hmm. Me, him, and Steve, we're friends. There's no pressure. He was just into it, you know? Yeah, 100%. And, you know, it, <laughs> it has that modern feel, but it also has that real classic vibe, almost uh, classic rock, almost meets, you know, little hints of a Motown kind of vibe, just a hint, you know? I mean, is that yep. sort of a – how do you guys sort of bring yourselves back while also remaining so current with, you know, the cutting edge technology and the clear sound. Well, Ozzy wanted to have a blues influence. That's where that Motown thing is. No, he's steeped in the blues. And Steve and I, like I said, we wanted to write the Ozzy riff that was needed. 
that 90s heavy classic Aussie, you know? Yeah. And I don't know. It it, it was it's a chemistry thing. I mean, I if I sat define. down, yeah, if I sat down today to write that, I probably couldn't. It was a moment in time with the right people and something happened. In terms of Ozzy and your relationship, how did you guys actually meet? Uh, do you remember the first time that you met? Of course, yeah. I went to a Christmas party at the Osbournes' house many, many, many years ago, nearly three decades ago. And the Osbournes' Christmas parties are something to behold. You know, it's 80 degrees in LA, but there was real snow and reindeer and a toboggan in the back garden. It was crazy. <laughs> and I get social anxiety. I'm not good in a room full of big shots from Hollywood, you know. So I I went into this, I opened this door to get away from the party because I was feeling anxious and Ozzy was in there. And I said, oh, shit, sorry, dude. And he went, oh, no, no, come in. I'm Ozzy. And I said, I know that. I'm Billy. And we just sat there. He said, what, what are you doing? I said, I am so overwhelmed with this party. And he said, me too. And we sat there talking about all kinds of stuff. We we just hit it off. He gave me his number, and I called him the next day. Wow. So that moment of being actually genuine and letting your guard down actually you know, 100%, further than you could expect, right? 100%. And, you know, he needed me as much as I needed him in that moment because we both suffer from it. And, <clears throat> you know, to be honest, it was a couple of, couple of Englishmen living in LA at a party they didn't want to be at. Right. I mean, That's and it's, it's one of those things where, you know, you guys are, you know, in LA obviously for your careers and it's, it's been incredibly beneficial, but I mean, you know, how does it feel? Do you sometimes feel like the odd man out? Because even Ozzy, you know, people have said he seems like a working class kid from Birmingham still. That's the attitude that he, that he's retained. Well, I think it's about gratitude. Uh, every morning I wake up in my beautiful house in Beverly Hills with the life that I have, and I have to reflect on where I've come from. And I do reflect, and I have a huge surge of gratitude, and that gets me through the day, and I do that every day. Yeah. What What was your sort of early upbringing like, and whereabouts in the UK were you from? Um, South London, Brixton, a lot of it, a lot of drugs. I mean, I've done interviews where I've talked about my drug habit. Um, and it wasn't the life that I have now. So I guess I'm proof that if you, um, it's work ethic. I've worked really hard to get away from that life. And I have the life that I have now. So for how many years would you say, Billy, were you in the throes of addiction issues? It was about 15 years, um, just under 15 years. And I did it the wrong way. Most of my friends formed a band, got a couple of platinum records, bought a big house, and then got the drug habit. And I couldn't even do it that way around. I started when I was 14. So, you know, at 29, I woke up out of this drug haze going, oh, shit, I've wasted a lot of years. So... That'll give you a work ethic. And here I am, not 29, but with a career, you know. For sure. And hugely, hugely grateful for every day that I'm alive and not in jail. Yeah. I mean, did it come close to, you know, becoming that? Yeah. Closer than you, closer than I'm going to talk about right now. Sure. I could understand that. Yeah. This is, is, I mean, it's definitely been something that I've been, uh, you know, dealing with a lot because I'm working on a uh, documentary currently about opioid addiction. Oh, and, you know, it's, it's the people I've spoken with. It's, it's been incredibly eye opening. You know, it's, I mean, do you think that it would be different today to be going through those issues just with the, the different variables that are involved? Not really. Not really. Because, well, the only difference today is the drugs kill you quicker. Right. <laughs> things like fentanyl weren't around then. So when you bought heroin on the streets, you were buying somewhat heroin. Right. These days, it'll kill you, you know? Um, so that side of things is different, but the, 
the treatment and care for people that are immersed in that world is pretty much still the same misunderstood. There's more of it. You, there's more resources, but it's still a huge stigma if you're a drug addict. And, you know, one of my primary purposes these days is to show people that I was a bad man and now I'm not. It is possible to turn your life around. And people need to hear that so that these poor guys that are in that world still, which was me, mm -hmm. I was that guy you would cross the street from and be scared of. And I'm not now. And, and that's the, the message to the world is please let's not stigmatize these people because they are all human beings and I am a living, breathing example of how possible it is to go from that kind of depth to this kind of high. Hmm. Absolutely. Such polar opposites, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's very polar opposite. Definitely. I mean, do, do you feel like it's, you know, do you think it did more harm than good, the whole glorification of that lifestyle that went on in rock and metal throughout, you know, especially the 70s and 80s? Because I feel like by the end of the 90s, a lot of people started to learn because they felt the effects. That's a really good question. <clears throat> I think a lot of a lot of it is it is what it is. You know, um, it got glamorized because the real life effects of addiction hadn't become as prevalent as they are now. In the 70s, when Aerosmith was snorting most of Columbia, so was all of New York and all the nightclubs. And the, the effects of that kind of drug use hadn't become homelessness, tents along the sidewalk and all of that. <clears throat> so, of course, it got glamorized. But as the 80s came in, it became obvious that not everyone is Steven Tyler or Keith Richards. And all the rest of them were suffering huge financial problems, uh, social problems. That can, you, you know, it became um, a global problem, the fallout from op opium addiction. So... I don't think there's any point in thinking, well, the glamorization was at fault because that was going to happen. That, you know, that's what got me into it. I was looking at Johnny Thunders and I just thought he, he looked cool. I didn't know the ramifications of that. I just knew he, he was a heroin addict and he was skinny and he, he had this look in his eyes that he didn't, he didn't care what people thought. Well, I, I wanted that. You know, um, and, and I think human nature, people are going to experiment with stuff. I just think the message has to be a lot clearer these days, you know? Yeah. No, I, I completely agree with that. That's a really good perspective. You know, speaking on, you know, building yourself up, obviously, to the man that you are today, you're you're involved in many different things, obviously, music, radio. Um, sort of when did the, the Billy Idol uh, aspect come in? Obviously, you've been with them for over you know, just about 15 years. I'm, I'm curious about that partnership and how that's evolved. That was all Steve Stevens. About 15 years ago, him and Billy were kind of rebranding, reforming, new music, big push. And Steve said to Billy, we should be a two-guitar band, and I've got the guy. And Billy said, okay. So I got the call and uh, that was it. And it changed my life. The phone call changed my life in, in that I was pushed to become a better guitar player working with Steve Stevens. Um, I was forced to write better songs because I've written songs with Steve and Billy. And I can't imagine being in any other band now. I mean, it's perfect. Those guys are amazing. What would you say are some of the traits of these people that, you know, you've worked with and, and collaborated alongside? Because we're talking about people who have massively long careers. You know, the longevity of these people's careers is almost unrivaled. Are there any sort of shared traits that these people have that has kept them going for so long? Well, the thing is, 
I, with Royal Machines and Billy Idol, I've shared the stage with most of the iconic musicians that are still alive and a lot that are dead now. So I've managed to see what it takes to have that kind of longevity in your career. And it's a, it's a sense of honesty in what you do, staying true to who you are. Um, innate talent. I mean, talent does trump everything. And, yeah, like I say, honesty and integrity. All, all, the, all the icons that I've shared a stage with, let's think Lou Reed, Ozzy, Steven Tyler, Slash, the list is endless. They all have an integrity about what they do that is above most of most of the other people trying to make music right you know that integrity that those icons have it shines from them when they walk on a stage they are just them take it or leave it i'm slash this is what i do i'm ozzy this is what i do and it's it's uh it's fantastic to be around yeah no, that that definitely adds up. You know, speaking on uh, Billy Idol and Steve Stevens, you know, I wonder what was the dynamic like for Mr. Dream, obviously coming up on the Morrison project. Was it very much similar to Billy Idol in the sense that you guys all write together or, or was it different being that it was your project? So Mr. Dream was a little different. Um, I'd written, I had this song and it seemed weird that I was doing this what was becoming an album with all my friends on it and Billy wasn't on it. So I asked if he would be interested in being on it. He said, yes, yeah, send me a song. So I pulled out this one riff that I knew was perfect for Billy and I sent it to Steve. Steve made some changes, some adjustments. We sent it back to Billy with the title, Mr. Dream, and a sketch of what it was about, and he loved it. So we finished the lyrics, and we just, again, it was one of those where I did all the music and, and got it got it finished, and then we took it into a studio, and Billy was there about half an hour. Wow. He'd, he'd learned the lyric, and he came in, and he sang the lyric like only Billy Idol can. Of course. And then he, and then he goes away, and we mix it. That's it. So was Steve very much hands-on in, you know, mixing the tracks that he was featured on as well? Steve didn't mix anything. We okay. both, we both on, on the tracks that Steve was involved in, it was pure collaboration writing it. Okay. You see, every everyone these days has studios. Yeah. So it's all digital. We fly the files backwards and forwards, and he'd make arrangement changes, chop it up. <laughs> but when it came to mixing, the whole album was mixed by a guy called Barry Pointer. And you want that. He did a phenomenal job. And you want that because that gives the consistency, especially on an album where there's eight different singers. Yeah. That must you be know, really challenging. Five different, five different guitar players. So Barry, he puts his his magic all over it and it sounds consistent even though there's a ballad with linda perry and a rap song with dmc and a metal song with ozzy that's so cool that it could remain consistent though the consistency wasn't by design i just realized once i was making a record i needed someone to mix the whole thing and barry had been working with john five and the Motley Crue guys, and had done some stuff with Manson. And uh, he was recommended to me, and I just gave him one track. And he sent me that one track back, and it was like, oh, my God. Yeah. Please, will you do the whole record? And now that's what we've got, a Barry Pointer mixed record. It sounds phenomenal. He did an amazing job. He definitely did. Yeah, no, the, the the record is honestly tremendous. Just curious about sort of your radio background. Obviously, a lot of people know you from your radio presence. And, you know, now, you know, they've seen you on the Osbournes podcast. Uh, maybe speak to us about your passion for that and your talent there. I mean, it's not necessarily a passion. I like doing it. I fell into it. 
Okay. You know, when, when I had a band called Camp Freddy with Dave Navarro, it became Royal Machines, just a name change. But it was Dave Navarro and me and Donovan Leach, Mark McGrath. Indy 103, which was an FM station, came to us and said, would you like your own radio show? And none of us could think of a reason to say no. <laughs> so we said, yeah, all right. And from there, it's just been always something that has come my way. I got asked to do the serious show with Ozzy. Of course, I'm going to do that. It's a load of fun. And then they asked me to do my own show on Sirius. So now I have that. Um, and then I do the podcasts with Ozzy. It's just, I think if you're a creative person, you're going to say yes to most avenues that give you creativity. Creativity is what keeps me out of jail, really. I think a lot of people could relate to that. You know? <laughs> There's no question there. So, I mean, you know, you keep yourself going that way. Um, yeah. But, but no, I think it's awesome, man. And uh, listen, Thank I really you. appreciate the time, Billy. For everybody listening, the Morrison Project. Are we saying the release date? Is that public yet? It's April, April 19th. Okay. Just wanted to, to double check. And of course, Crack Cocaine featuring Ozzy Osbourne and Steve Stevens is going to drop on March 21st. And we'll have all the links for you guys to connect with Billy Morrison down below in the description. 